Thank you, and it's good to be back. And uh, coming up now is Kevin McCarthy. He is the House Majority Leader. Uh, he is in his fifth term serving California's 23rd district since 2007. And I just heard, I believe he is the fastest rising member, he can correct me, maybe it's Republican, but member uh, in history. So come on out, Kevin McCarthy. Thank you. Did I get that right? Yes, outside of Henry Clay. Henry oh, Clay went straight to speaker, but for a whip and leader, yes. I always forget Henry Clay. How can you forget <laughs> him? Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's start with something that is, well, you have a lot on your plate, but something mm -hmm. that is going to be on your plate soon, as soon as the Senate deals with it, which is, uh, I think you would say, uh, is a big economic issue, which is trade. Uh, are you going to have the votes for it? We, we will get trade done. Um, you need some Democrat votes regardless. But if you look at the last three trade bills, I was whip at the time. We did them all in one day, and we had very strong. And trade economically, I think when people hear the message of what TPA will actually do, give more power back to Congress even. Um, I think you'll get enough on both sides to pass it. But if we're able to get TPA done, and get TPP going to Europe, that's two thirds or, of the entire world being able to trade. And the other item that I think is so important, not just economically, but to our security and to our allies. So at the end of the day, trade will get done. Certainly there's a split on both sides, uh, in, both, in both parties. But Much more on one side than the More other. on one side than the other, but, but in the Senate, it's definitely a, a democratic problem for the Democratic president, that there are just a lot more Democrats who are opposed to it. But Same problem in the House. But, but, you're, but you are, I mean, talk about kind of where your caucus is, where your conference is. Do you feel like you're going to get Overwhelming, majority the them? majority of our caucus is supportive of it. But the challenge here has always been, we said from the very beginning on this, just have 50 Democrats and one Democrat in leadership support it and we can move forward. I don't know the one in Democratic leadership that supports it. Um, I don't think the Democrats are anywhere near that number on supportive. So I think if the president has a conversation with them about the importance of where it goes. Now there's some members in our caucus who support trade but have concerns about the argument that somehow you're giving the president power here. Well every president in modern history has had trade promotion authority. The difference of this negotiation, which I think Paul Ryan has done a tremendous job, it still gives a say to the House. So it gives those protections that members have some concerns with. Um, we'll actually do a conference this Thursday before we depart all on trade. So everybody can ask any questions they have, be able to get them answered. Because I really think our way forward is to expand economically. In the Senate, Mitch McConnell has been describing working with President Obama on this as an out-of-body experience. Um, what, what's your impression of the way that, the, you know, the kind of the strange bedfellows on this? And, and more importantly, this is kind of my obsession, is how you can use moments that the stars align and the parties come together as a learning experience for future discussions across party lines? I always think it's very healthy if you can find those times that you all agree and push, you build strength, you know? No, nothing makes it stronger when you both work together and get a positive outcome. Um, the president's challenge is with his party and you had the union so far out front for the last three years locking members down to a no in the Democrats, but the arguments he uses for the Democrats about give me the power to that argument, trying to persuade them in a different fashion, moves members, our members away uh, because of all the combativeness that you had in the past. But I would argue that this Congress has been much more productive. You look at SGR, for 14 years, Congress has kicked that down the road, no longer, and we did entitlement reform with it. So. I think at the end of the day, trade gets done, and it's going to be a very positive experience for America. Okay, so you mentioned SGR. Uh, I asked Tom Price, who was here earlier, about that and whether the fact that John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi, and you know better than anyone, that they don't, that not necessarily on a, you know, speed dial, in a speed dial situation, that they did work together. They met face to face. They were on the phone. Their staffs worked together, and 
it worked because they actually were talking to each other like, like people do when they try to come to a, an agreement and negotiate. How much of that is uh, a template for what you can do? I mean, you know, I, I understand that there were little bite-sized pieces on this, but as you said, DocFix has been an issue for decades. I think DocFix and Sustainable Growth Rate, SGR, will go down in this Congress as one of the ma major accomplishments. Because you've got to think, 14 years you haven't been able to do it. So what are the lessons learned? I would say a couple different lessons learned. We didn't make it complex by putting everybody in the room, meaning the administration wasn't there. Lots of times we have found for the last couple of years when we negotiate with the administration, they can't come to a conclusion. Members come and run for office because they want to legislate. Now, the positive about SGR, we had the policy done, it was the pay for. And so we had to think a little differently, and I, I give the speaker and our conference a lot of credit. Because the real savings that we're going to get in entitlements don't happen in the first 10 years, they happen in the next, the multiplying effect. One of the frustrations I have is how we score everything in 10 years. So do we all assume America is going to stop on that 11th year that we're going to end? When you really change entitlement reform, that's when the fishtails start to happen. So we looked at a longer time frame of what we wanted to look like. And having that agreement where both got something they wanted, both made it tougher, but we held together. The Senate said they didn't want to take it, but when the vote was so strong at the end of the day, the Senate took it 98 to 2. That can be a template for every issue that we have going forward that's a cliff, because cliffs are not positive. Whenever we have cliffs in Congress, that's all we think about. We can't think about anything else. And then, then we get pushed up against the wall and we do something short. We just kick it down the road, which we've done with SGR. So to me, that is the very best template to use going forward. And, and you know, Congress has been going from cliff to cliff, from crisis to crisis for, for years, for, for various reasons. Uh, and that really is not good for, I mean, never mind, it's just, it, it, it gives everybody in Congress heartburn, but nobody in America cares about that. They care about the fact that they don't have certainty uh, and when it comes to the economic stability, whether, whether it's their businesses, whether it's their you know, local government and so forth. So we have another one coming. Uh, the Murray-Ryan budget runs out at the end of the fiscal year. You have uh, your budget that you all passed, uh, which very much differs from the kind of spending that the president wants to do. He wants to do increase, if we can do increase in defense spending, he wants to increase in domestic spending. So are we gonna be right back in the same place on September 30th? Well, let me, let me take your question, take a step back. I agree, cliffs are terrible. They're bad for policy. They're bad for she or he who serves because that's not why you run. It's bad for America. It's bad for everybody outside, no consistency. What has been the focus of this first Congress. Dana knows I always take metrics, because I believe you have to measure where you are and you have to be honest about where you can go, some successes, some failures. But when you look at the current Congress, we are the second most productive Republican Congress you've had in our lifetime. And what do I measure that on? I'll measure it on bills coming out of the House, bills that are signed into law, bills that come out of committee. You really want to look to the committee because the more the committee's productive, the more the problems that get solved. A 40-year average is 6.6% .6 of bills get out of committee. The last two Congresses, we were at 2.5 and 3.5. Today, we're at 7.6 in the first 100 days. We're twice as productive as we were last Congress. Taking just SGR, there was something else into it. It was the biggest entitlement reform you had in more than 20 years. And then we had another cliff coming forward in S-CHIP. Well, we've taken that away. So if you look at all the challenges coming forward in the year, the more that you can take it away, the stronger that you'll be. We've got highways coming up. Now, we have been working together with the Democrats, and this is, goes to the core of your question. This is the earliest we've ever started the appropriation process. You might think, well, that's kind of basic, but we really haven't had a strong appropriation process for quite some time. It's the first time in a long time that you had budgets on both sides, which also gives you reconciliation, gives you greater strength of going forward. Now, if the president wants to criticize our budget, our budget is written based to law, and it's also balances in 10 years. We write our appropriations based upon law if you want to change the law. 
the other side of the aisle has now decided that they want to vote against everything because they're opposed to sequester, which the president, it was his idea. But you have to change the law to do that. You can't do that in the budget. You can't do that in the NDAA, but that's why they voted against it. You can't do that in highways, but that's why they want to vote against it. And now they want to start voting against the appropriation process. I think if we're able to get a few of these appropriations to the president's desk, that would answer. I would tell on our side of the aisle, we would gladly do something about sequester, but we're not going to raise taxes. We're going to deal with the mandatory side of the spending. And if they want to deal with that, we'll gladly come to some agreement. I want to get to mandatory to entitlements in one second, yeah. but, but you said that, that Democrats were you know, opposed to the appropriations, uh, opposed to the, uh, the, the sequester, but my impression is what they're opposed to in, these, in your budget is that you're raising spending for defense and not for domestic programs. And that that's what they're, by and large, big picture, opposed to, and that's what the president is likely to veto. No, we put money into OCO. We, have, we keep the level. We balance within 10 years. The president said he will not sign anything that goes to the sequester level. Well, the sequester level is law. So are we supposed to break the law? So the point I have is, that if the, if the president is serious about that, he should sit down and find ways that we can make fundamental changes into entitlements. We have said many times before, we will not go out of the realm. You give us everything you requested in your budget for entitlement reform, we'll agree to those. Okay, but so, he doesn't want to get there. Okay, so let's talk about entitlements. Yes. In the real world, knowing what Democrats' issues are and their, their demands are, knowing what your own base, what your issues are and what the demands are, where do you see a realistic area to reform entitlements, whether you're talking about Medicare, Social Security, or maybe you know, jumping off of, of, the, uh, of the doc fix deal? Well, if you look at the doc fix, do you know we, we means tested inside Medicare Part B? And if we had this discussion prior to that, no one would say anybody would agree to that. The president has put into his budget changing of CPI. That's a lot of money. There is a lot of different places, but I, I think it's more productive if we sit down and have those discussions instead of just sitting back and not talking and trying to vote against something that can't change it. But those are sort of nibbling at the edges. Do you think that that's realistically the best way to get at it, or do you think that there is room? I know grand bargain obviously didn't work, but is there room for a broader discussion, for a broader overhaul uh, for the long term? There's, pl there's plenty. There's plenty of room to do that. I think. In the time and place where this president is serving, I don't think he would go there. Um, I'm not sure the other side would, but this is a discussion that we should have and actually deal with. Otherwise, we're in tremendous trouble. But this is something that the Republican majority has started from the very beginning. When we first wrote our budget, even Republicans on the Senate side told us we were crazy, told us we couldn't do that. Now it's become the norm. And most of that is saving the country, balancing it, but also dealing with those hardest questions of entitlement. But it's, I mean, this was the worst case, you know, sort of nightmare scenario sequester. And we've been living in it for four years because there was no. We were living it, but we also, we to also get had a Murray Ryan change to it. And today's world is unsafe. We look at what's happening around the world, I think people look to. Um, if you're continuing to downside the military, can you still secure America's interests around the world and at home? The question would be no. You mentioned Murray Ryan. Uh, talk about the discussions to update that, to avoid the shutdown showdown in the fall. Is there a way to do that, given the climate that we're in right now? I mean, because because the way you paint it, and I, I think just to give everybody credit, mm -hmm. um, there is more, I mean, it's to go from zero to, you know, one or five percent isn't that far, but there is more, it does have, you do have a vibe of people wanting to work together a little bit more. So I, I actually believe if you, if you go to members on both sides of the aisle, one member got up in conference the other day and said, they've done more in these fi last five weeks than they've done in the last four years. So they're feeling it. So there's a capability. There's also one success builds on the next success. And SGR is an example. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that highways can be another one. Look, the president and all of us understand 
we want to have something to do with infrastructure, that our infrastructure is old in America. If you do a short term, it doesn't solve the problem. You want to have a long term infrastructure, but it takes resources. So where do you get the resources? Well, one of the ideas that have been growing out there is repatriation. We have, we are in a world economy and you're keeping all this money in other countries because the structure dictates behavior. But if we went to a territorial, that would bring a lot of money back. So could you utilize that for infrastructure for a time basis and have like a five year bill and be able to move forward? But you'd need those two to line up. The way I look at everything, I look at everything in coalitions because we make policy in the world of politics and you've got to get enough votes to get it through. So my idea is how do I get enough in this coalition with this coalition? That, that's what SGR did. You got a number of docs that want the policy fixed. You got people that are looking out at SCHIP coming up further. You're looking at people that want, um, want entitlement reform. Well you put all three of those together and you had a very big coalition. Well highways is one big coalition dealing um, Territorial tax reform is another big correlation. Corporate rate's way too high. So if you mirrored that and you moved highways towards the end of the year and you matched that up with enough time for tax reform, you could gain something very big and uh, solve a lot of problems. It would take people on both sides of the aisle. So linking the idea of tax reform, which when the Republicans took full control of Congress uh, at the beginning of, th of this year, that was one of the things that Republicans and Democrats inside the White House and out said that this might be an area where you could actually potentially work together. Um, you think that linking tax reform and the highway bill is a viable idea? I see uh, a needle I can get through. <laughs> um, we're going to give the authorization to go to July 31st in highways. Where are you going to get more money? You cannot pass a higher gas tax. Where are you going to grab the money from? We've got a challenge with our tax code. So those are two problems, but they're also two solutions that can put us on a framework to be able to compete. Think about it. If we were able to do trade, infrastructure, and be able to compete with tax reform, that next century looks pretty good for America. And if you've got enough coalitions with all three, why not empower them and make them stronger? I believe, yes, we can. And just to be clear on, on the tax reform we're talking about here is corporate. Corporate only, or is it uh, across well, the I'm board? never going to second guess Paul Ryan. And Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution says all tax reform starts in the House. <laughs> We've done a lot of work beforehand. In the last Congress, Dave Camp did tremendous work. Territorial is where you, you can't just do repatriation. It does not score that way. The other item that you should look at, as I say, structure dictates behavior we have moved to dynamic scoring. So when you get dynamic scoring, you also could think bigger and broader. It gives you greater opportunities, just like how we would look at SGR into the second decade of savings. Let me just ask you, just uh, in the couple minutes we have left, take it up to 10,000 feet a little bit on maybe some, some lessons learned. Coming into the leadership mm -hmm. five years ago, I guess, taking over the, uh, the House, uh, Republican, it was it was a bumpy road for a little while. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that Republicans genuinely shifted the terms of the debate uh, to how much are we going to cut as opposed to are we going to cut. Uh, but it, it wasn't so easy getting there because of a lot of for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons was divisions among Republicans. What what have you all learned as Republicans governing about the best way to actually make a decision on what your fiscal policy is and get there? Well, I can look at it different ways. I could say Republicans changed the debate, or I could say the Democrats changed the debate because they spent so much and they helped Republicans get to the majority. Um, I think it's more along that line that helped for, made, made us rise up. Um, I would have I hoped that at that first time we took the majority, that that divided government would have found the common ground at that moment. That was the window. Um, it was also the window after the Senate right now, too, where the administration and the House and Senate could have grabbed big things. And that first year before an election year, I mean, I look at, um, I do a lot of studying in history. And when you look at Clinton and you look at Reagan, they had divided government. 
but they did tax reform, they did um, welfare reform and others, but it took that relationship and that trust to go out. Um, I think that's the window we missed, but that's enough blame on all sides. Uh, you cannot sustain this debt. You cannot sustain the current entitlement programs. You've got to have an honest debate. I'm very proud of where Republicans have taken that debate and made it more the norm so others can have it as well. Um, I still believe, I'm very bullish on this year, that, again, if we do trade, if we do infrastructure, and we do tax reform, we're in the basis of the next century being in the right place at the right time. I do believe, though, this presidential election, and a lot of the things that we do, maybe it does not become law. For all the success we had on the floor, we've also doubled the number of vetoes the president has done. The president only did two vetoes in the first six years. He's already done two. He's done a number. He's done, in the first five days, I think he had more veto threats than he's had in the last six years. Um, I think this presidential election is going to be about the future. So whoever lays out the vision, but also deals with foreign policy, is really going to be the person that wins the election. And if there's any time in history it's similar to today, is 1979. One last question, since you mentioned 2016. Um, how much harder does it make your job to get things done that you have 723 people running for the Republican nomination? I think it makes McConnell's job harder. <laughs> um, well, but just in terms of setting the, setting the debate. I, I think it's helpful. More people pay attention to politics and policy in presidential years. I think we have to show we can govern, which I, I believe we are doing. The next year, I think politics will play a little more into it. But what we do can actually help the nominee in 2016. I mean, think, for instance, how much work we have to do. The Pew Research just came out. The millennials are the largest in the workforce, right? I have a few at home. The millennial generation have never watched their government be competent. They didn't watch us land on the moon. They didn't watch us win World War II. They did not see Desert Storm. They watched a VA system not be able to care for the veterans. Every millennial knows how to build a website, but they watched government take billions of dollars and couldn't build one. They watched the IRS go after people for their own beliefs, but no one get held accountable. They watched the Secret Service not even be able to protect the White House and found out we don't even lock the door. So they're wide open for change. But the other part of my argument of why it's 1979 again and why it's purpose for that, foreign policy. When was the last time, regardless of what party you're in, we're all Americans, when was the last time we watched ourselves get held hostage? In Iran and with ISIS. When was the last time a US ambassador was killed on foreign soil? 79 in Afghanistan, Stevens in Libya. When was the last time you watched the Soviet Union invade another country? 79, Russia today. And then the last question that kind of really stems from all that, the malaise that Americans feel. The whole question, if you watch the debate in the presidential of 1980, go back to the night before the election and watch what Reagan said. He rented all three networks and he spoke for 30 minutes. That exact speech could be given today, the rise of regulation, the fear of where we stand within the world today, the malaise of what we feel. Do we accept this new norm? or do we expand and grow out of this? The participation rate in America today is 62.7%. 93 million Americans have given up looking for jobs. It's the lowest participation rate since 1978. I tell you that not to depress you, but I tell you that because I knew what the outcome was. That's when America wakes up when the pendulum has swung so far, and I think the first steps you've seen in Congress are those first steps through it. Mr. Leader, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. And as he goes out, we are going to be joined by his Democratic counterpart. Steny Hoyer is the House Democratic Whip. He is, I believe it's his 18th term. Did I get that right? 18th term in the House, representing Maryland's 5th District since 1981. 18 terms? It was 81. Thankfully, it wasn't 79. <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we should 
start where he left off about, you know, Republicans are arguing that things are moving a little bit better. I mean, as you well know, because you had full Democratic control at one point, not that long ago, <laughs> it's easier when you have both parties running, uh, both, part, both houses of Congress. Do you see a, a light there? Do you see a light of, of a glimmer of hope when it comes to negotiating with the other side of the aisle on some big important things? I certainly think when Republicans decide to work with Democrats, things work better. Uh, and the reason for that is because they've had trouble, as we've all seen, creating majorities on their own side, which was different than when uh, uh, we were in charge, where we got almost always 218 votes on our side of the aisle for the propositions we put forward. Um, because the Republicans can't do that, the only way that we've, they've been effective in moving things is when they uh, decided to work with our side of the aisle. Uh, they're very proud of, correctly, I think, of the uh, sustainable growth rate uh, made permanent and the SCHIP and the community health centers. Uh, what happened was uh, they had a disastrous uh, uh, confrontation on the Department of Homeland Security where McConnell ultimately said, look, we've gone down this cul-de-sac and you keep thinking it's going to be a highway. It's not going to be. We've got to change. So he passed through the Senate a uh, clean Department of Health, um, uh, uh, Homeland Security funding bill. Um, Boehner's people demanded that they send it back one more time with the request that uh, we have a conference on uh, changing the immigration policy of the president. Boehner didn't think that was going to be successful, but that's what his people wanted to do. And he was amazed that we voted against it. 174 Democrats voted against it. But his problem was not that 174 Democrats voted against it, 52 Republicans voted against it, which meant he couldn't get the majority again for his party. But I think that really, in some ways, we won that, and shortly thereafter, we funded the Department of Homeland Security. But what it did was it empowered uh, Speaker Boehner to then say to his folks, look, that didn't work very well. Now, the SGR is going to end on March 31st, and we can go down a cul-de-sac again, or I can go across uh, the aisle and talk to Leader Pelosi and see if we can get a bipartisan deal. He came across the aisle. Leader Pelosi's staff and my staff, along with the committee staff, worked with the Republicans, and we got a bill that was uh, done and we passed overwhelmingly, called over 382 votes uh, for it, and it passed the Senate uh, about 10 days later. Uh, that was success. But uh, the same day, the same week that we uh, had success on SGR, the day before we passed a budget, totally partisan. Mm -hmm. Not a single Democrat voted for the budget. Now, budgets are usually partisan documents, as I think probably all of you know, but the Ryan budgets were never implemented. The price budget will never be implemented, and the Republicans know it won't be implemented. I was listening to uh, Mr. McCarthy speak. Uh, the fact of the matter is, he says, sequester is the law. Well, we changed the law. We changed the law with Ryan Murray. Why did we change the law? Because in my view, the Republicans knew that they could not implement uh, their Ryan budget, and they needed to change it. And they did not want to try to implement it prior to the election. Mm -hmm. So they made a two-year fix uh, in the sequester. Inevitably, in my view, Dana, we're going to make another fix in sequester, because I don't believe if there were no Democrats in the House of Representatives, or the United States Senate, the Republicans could implement uh, the sequester numbers. Okay, so you just touched on two things that I, wa I want to uh, kind of dig deeper on. Uh, and let's start w with, with that, with the budget, the Republican budget. Right. Um, as you said, they are historically political documents. Yeah. You, you did it, you, I mean, Democrats did it uh, when you all were in charge. Uh, and it sets the terms for the spending bills, right, that are going to come, allegedly. Well, it, it allegedly. Maybe, maybe does. It didn't on the National Defense Authorization Act. Yeah, ex well, right. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you all have said that you are going to oppose a lot of it because, for various reasons, but the biggest is because of uh, the spending levels were increased for defense and not for domestic uh, programs. 
and the president has said he, he would veto it. So how do we get from a partisan budget, which is, again, understandable, it's the way it works around here, for better or worse, uh, to fast forward to the end of the fiscal year, where we actually have to, you have to fund the government? Well, you go from, uh, in the, when I, I came out of the Maryland State Senate, you had a, you had a unified budget and appropriation bill. You have a budget right. document, which is a plan. But the implementation of that plan is through the Appropriations Committee or Ways and Means Committee or some of the other committees. Uh, what they have not done is implemented their budgets. They've passed a budget, you're right, and we, we agree it's a partisan document, it's a statement of uh, objectives. Uh, but getting from here to there is a lot tougher. And what I think is going to happen inevitably is that at some point in time over the next uh, four, five, six months, we're going to adopt uh, some change in the sequester so that domestic discretionary spending is uh, allowed to have the flexibility for investments that we need to grow our economy and grow jobs and be competitive as the Republicans uh, did on the National Defense Authorization Act. How are you going to do that? Because they just adopted mm -hmm. the president's number. Right. And the way they did it, as you pointed out earlier, was to take OCO money, uh, which is for contingencies, and apply that to regular uh, ongoing spending. How do you do that? <clears throat> you get to a point where I think the Senate and the House will both recognize, as they did uh, two years ago and last year, they could not pass bills at their numbers. In fact, Hal Rogers, who's the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, conservative Republican, uh, who said that uh, the sequester was ill-advised and unrealistic. That's not Steny Hoyer or a Democrat uh, well, saying that. It is because Hal it wasn't Rogers. supposed to be the law of the land. It was the you know break the glass in case of emergency. And Actually, it wasn't supposed to be the law of the land. It is the law of the land. I agree with it. Right. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that in 2013, when we uh, included sequester as a backup which, by the way, it was not the president's idea. Uh, the reason Jack Lew brought it up is because it was included in the Republican bill a few days before that, the budget, as a backup for failure to cut uh, to where they thought the le levels should be. But whether whose idea it was, nobody thought it was going to go into effect. Right. And the reason being because we set up a so-called super committee. That super committee was to arrive at a deal. They were arrived at a deal by November 25th uh, of that year, 2012. Uh, and the problem is that the failure of that group that had 90 days to meet on November 25th was made easier because we said sequester would be not done until 13 months later, January 2014. As a result, clearly everybody thought sequester would be fixed. It was not. So it was a failure. But we're stuck with it. Uh, Ryan saw we were stuck with it and said it's not workable, so he and Murray made a deal. And That's what I think we're going to have to do again. And so, like, a, I, I, was, I was asking the, the, your Republican colleagues, like a Murray-Ryan 2.0 yeah. situation, and is that where you think that there could be some agreement on um, discretionary domestic spending? Yes. I think, I think that's what's going to have to How happen. are you going to get Republicans to agree to that? Same way we got them, I don't know, we got them to agree with that they made a determination that they could not affect realistically uh, their plan. I mean, Ryan, we didn't force Ryan to do that. Uh, Ryan didn't have to do it. Uh, the problem is they had the responsibility of passing bills. As you recall, they, the, the labor health bill, which is the largest dis, uh, non-defense discretionary bill, was never brought to subcommittee by the Republicans. Now, they control the subcommittee. They control the full, full committee. They could have brought it to the floor. Not only did they not bring it to the floor, but they never brought it to subcommittee. The bottom line is, and, and Dana, this is going to be my theme, we need to bring some certainty mm -hmm. and reasonableness to this debate, not simply political messaging on either side of what either side would like to happen, but bring the certainty of an agreement on fiscal policy, on tax policy, on immigration uh, policy, on export-import bank, uh, on highway trust fund, 
There are so many things that this board of directors called the Congress of the United States has a responsibility to affect, which we are not doing in a way that gives confidence to our economy and to our allies around the world and trading partners. No question, but that has been the responsibility of Congress forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and certainly in the past several years, it, it simply hasn't happened. We have been careening from crisis to crisis. So Largely because of ideology. Entirely because of, of ideology. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, people come with different philosophies on, on how government should be run or not, but the expectation and the hope that voters have is that you all can actually, you know, sit down and roll up your sleeves and work things out. So how do you get to the point where we are not going from crisis to crisis? Well, I think crisis? to that extent, SGR is a perfect example. You walk across the aisle and say, okay, we have a problem. Uh, Doc reimbursement's going to end in a few weeks. Uh, we all want to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, how do we come to an agreement uh, that will affect that end? And we do so. It's how the Senate passed comprehensive immigration reform. They came together, and Republicans and Democrats decided how they were going to do it. That's, I mean, there's no secret. That's the way you've got to do it. And you cannot have uh, the, an ideology which says, this is my position, and I will not move from it. But that's the way both sides have been for, mm, for, I disagree for, with that, for a Dan. while. I don't think that's the case. I think uh, Democrats, in fact, have been willing to compromise. Uh, and I've been at this business a long time. I don't think there's a member of my party uh, on the House side that I can't go to almost uh, on any piece of legislation, even if they don't think it's perfect, and say, look, this is not perfect. It's not exactly what you want, but I need your vote. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason the Department of Homeland Security had 52 Republicans not follow their leadership, and in fact, when we made the ultimate deal, and you had Leader Boehner, excuse me, Speaker Boehner, Leader McCarthy, and uh, the Whip Scalise, all for a proposition that finally got this done. Only 72 of their colleagues stuck with them, mm -hmm. which means 167 went the other way because they thought it was not what they wanted. It was imperial. None of us in a legislative process get everything we want. But if we take this, the stance that that is the only thing we will support, we will not make the progress or give the confidence to the American people and to the rest of the world that our board of directors can work. Okay, so let's take that theme and bring it to the really, really hard stuff, which is <coughs> mandatory spending entitlements. Um, as you well know, Republicans say that a big reason why uh, entitlement reform hasn't happened is because uh, Democrats are, are bound by unions and by, by various Democratic constituencies that don't allow that didn't allow the president to move and make some sacrifices. <laughs> well, you, how do you respond to that? And, and more importantly, how do you go, go forward and, and build on the glimmers of hope? Well, I'm one of those, as you know, Dana, because you've heard me give speeches on this. Uh, uh, we're going to have to get our country on a fiscally sustainable path, and we'll have to be along the path of a Simpson Bowles or um, a Gang of Six. Uh, type of agreement where we deal with entitlements and we deal with revenues. Uh, the Republicans don't want to deal with revenues. The Democrats are very reluctant to deal with entitlements. However, having said that, uh, we came very close to an agreement. And that was uh, when President Obama and John Boehner had an agreement, in my view. And that agreement uh, was balanced. It dealt with entitlements and it dealt with revenues. In my view, uh, Speaker Boehner brought that back to his uh, folks, mm -hmm. and I think Mr. Ryan has made it clear, Mr. McCarthy just made it clear, revenues are not on the table. Mm -hmm. The gasoline tax is a perfect example. We have a highway belt coming up. We're going to extend it uh, uh, for 60 days, and then we will urge that that 60 days be used to come up with a funding source so that we can permanently, uh, or, or for six years at least, extend the highway bill. Right now, no governor, no county executive, no mayor, no county government can plan on a funding stream for infrastructure investment. That is not helpful to our economy. It's not helpful to the confidence uh, of our people. Uh, but we are funding uh, highways 
uh, with $93 while we're paying 2015 prices. Uh, that's not sustainable. So we've got to come up with a funding source. I talked to the majority leader yesterday, Mr. McCarthy. Mm -hmm. He's talking about tax reform, mm -hmm. um, which uh, I'd be glad to, and I told him, I'd like to see what you have to offer. Uh, but let's look at tax reform. We're all for tax reform. Do you, you talk to anybody who doesn't say we ought to have tax reform, that this wonderful tax bill that we have is not, uh, a, you know, jury built at the best uh, and uh, negative in its impact at worst? Uh, no, everybody says we're for tax reform. Okay, well, then you have to con put it into paper. David Camp did that. The Republican chairman of the Ways and Means Committee put on the table a comprehensive tax reform uh, bill uh, that was paid for. It was a zero sum. Uh, zero sum in the sense that uh, the tax cuts were balanced by revenue increases or elimination of other preference items, uh, and it was a zero sum game. It got no consideration by his own colleagues. And I have said David Camp showed courage and I think vision in putting that on the table. That's what we've got to do. Now, Mr. Ryan, who's a very bright, able fellow, I would hope would follow Camp's lead and put something on the table or have discussions with Mr. Levin and Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee to discuss how can we get from where we are a tax code that's broken, a tax code that uh, has perverse consequences in terms of uh, incentives or disincentives uh, for doing things that would be otherwise make good business sense. Uh, how can we get from there to where we need to be. The Boehner uh, uh, Obama talks on the fiscal uh, cliff uh, were very positive. They fell apart. They fell apart over the fact that one side would not discuss revenues, while Obama, at the criticism of a number of people in his own party, was talking about entitlements. Let's go back to um, the highway fund, though. Okay. I mean, it sounds like we might have the, uh, the seeds of an actual deal. If you say you're open to the idea of paying for uh, the highway bill, which as you said is, is matters a lot because it has to do with infrastructure, it has to do with you know, how states and, 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 and cities and local governments right. plan and, and how, they, how they're gonna spend their money or not. Do uh, you think that that's something that you could go for? He, he's talking about repatri repatriation. You know, I think that John Delaney, as you know, has a bill. Uh, the president has a proposal. Uh, Peter DeFazio, I think today, is introducing the president's proposal, which is about a $470 billion uh, proposal, uh, which relies in part on dealing with repatri repatriation mm -hmm. of offshore income. You asked me, would I be open to that? I think we would be open to that. John Delaney's bill, I think, has an equal number of Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate co-sponsoring it. Mm -hmm. He's made some changes to it, but I think that certainly that is an alternative that is a reasonable alternative. Now, whether I will support it ultimately, we'll have to look at, flesh it out and get the specifics of it. But the answer is, yes, that is a way to move forward. Now, I'm one of those that... Uh, uh, thinks that the user fee, i.e. the gasoline tax, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately does not reflect present costs. And as a result, uh, it's insufficient to do what we need to do in terms of infrastructure, particularly roads and bridges and highways. So we have a uh, little over a minute left, and I have to ask you about uh, something that is going to end up on your plate soon once the Senate passes it, and that's trade. Uh -huh. So far, there is no member of the House Democratic leadership that has come out in favor of trade. What's your position? I'm part of the Democratic leadership I know. that hasn't come but you're out. Not, but you haven't come out opposed to it and either. I haven't come out opposed so, to it either. So, so I've remained, are you a yes or a no? Remain flexible. And I remain flexible to this day. But it was a good try. Uh, <laughs> Look, this is uh, what happens when you've been in Congress since 1981. There you go. You're, <laughs> you're not you answering a question. You don't feel compelled to answer yeah. the question that's put no, to you. No, but, but have you seriously, let me, let me, have let you me decided? Say, let me, something, uh, when I came in, I was interesting. Uh, the, the, the need for 50 Democrats. Now, the Republicans say they're for the trade bill, but once again, apparently, they're divided enough that they need 50 of our side. On the three bills that Bush put forward, they had 218 votes for each one of them. Now, I, I voted for each one of those right. bills, as you know, as one of 17 Democrats that did. 
But the fact of the matter is, both parties are divided on this issue. We are more divided in the sense they're more in opposition, and the Republicans, I think, have more in favor. But both parties are deeply divided uh, on this issue. Why are they divided? The American public is not convinced that trade bills are good for them. Do you regret your votes for the trade bills no. in the past? No, I don't. No, not at all. Uh, but the American public, we're a representative body, and it's not just our, our friends in organized labor who are very close to me and whose opinions uh, I respect greatly, but it is that uh, when polled, a majority of independents, a majority of Republicans, a majority of Democrats express since great reservations about whether or not trade bills have been uh, positive uh, for jobs and growth in our country. But do you have those reservations? I mean, that, I, I believe, has anything changed? I, I believe trade you? bills have been positive uh, for us. Uh, what I think we have, though, is globalization and trade bills, particularly since 1993, have gone hand in hand. There is no doubt that globalization has hurt uh, particularly uh, lower skilled workers in America. There is no doubt that globalization has led to the offshoring of jobs. Now, I think the good news is uh, that we have an environment in which we're going to see uh, greater onshoring of jobs. Salaries are going up overseas. We're becoming, the, uh, interesting enough, the low-cost, uh, stable energy source in the world, uh, which is very, very important. So I, th I have an agenda I call uh, Make It in America. I think we can bring jobs home. Uh, but I think Americans are still very conflicted about whether or not trade is good for our country or bad for our country. And my friend Bill Daly, I think, is going to be talking, who uh, argued very persuasively, I thought, uh, in the New York Times today about how a trade is, is good for our country. You do not sound like someone who's going to vote against this trade bill. Well, I hope I don't sound like somebody who's going to telegraph what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I say that because you know, I'm one of the leaders in my caucus, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, Nancy Pelosi has said uh, we want to do things to try to get to yes. And we've been doing a lot of very extensive informational meetings mm -hmm. with the administration, with other experts, uh, to try to get our members uh, a, a confidence level that uh, being for either uh, fast track and, and by the way, Fast Track, I, I thought one of the Republicans had a very interesting uh, uh, observation. He was asked, well, what do you think about Fast Track? And he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, you know, we do 95 percent of the things around here with a closed rule anyway. What's the difference? <laughs> uh, Fast Track is simply a closed rule, essentially. Uh, but what Fast Track does is it sets forth objectives. Uh, and very frankly, the president's argument is that uh, this, this uh, agreement has pursued those objectives uh, more uh, intensely than any other previous agreement. The downside of that is you're dealing with uh, Vietnam, uh, which is a non-market non economy, a non-mirror economy. You're dealing with some very small states like Brunei and some others. Uh, this is uh, the first agreement that I can think of, uh, CAFTA perhaps was an exception, but that is uh, more than two states. Uh, obviously, NAFTA was two states. We've done all three of the bills that we did under Bush were single state uh, agreements, three different agreements. Australia uh, n n have been essentially dealing with one mm -hmm. entity. This is a multiple uh, nation agreement and therefore in that context a little more complicated uh, than uh, previous agreements. Well, I tried. <laughs> you, you, you did try. Uh, Thank you very much. Let me just end, yes, can, if I can. Of course. All of you are very significant leaders in our country. Uh, and one of the things the Republicans talked a lot about was building confidence. We have done, in my opinion, during the last four years, anything but that. Uh, we have threatened to not pay our debt and got to a crisis which uh, essentially led to the adoption of the sequester, mm -hmm. because that was the only way we could uh, meet our responsibilities and uh, extend our debt limit, which is a phony political issue. Uh, if you borrow the money, America says it's going to pay it back. The debt limit is a phony issue. We borrowed the money, we owe it, we're going to pay it back. Uh, 
But we need to create, whether it's through tax reform, whether it's through budgeting, whether it's through the adoption of such things as comprehensive immigration reform, a highway bill, the SGR, we need to establish uh, a confidence level among our own people and the rest of the world that we can do things in a reasonable, rational, uh, considered way without having to do so crisis to crisis to crisis. All of you, uh, I know, um, I think share that view, and all of you can have a real impact on making sure that each of us, Democrats and Republicans, uh, commit ourselves to that objective. Thank you very much for all you do. Thank you very much. Thank and I want to congratulate the Petersons uh, for having been so focused for such a long period of time on fiscal uh, rectitude, fiscal responsibility, and fiscal uh, propriety. Thank you. Thank you Good so see much. You. Good see you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all.